cancer and we have cancer. But we need to know as a BNB uh, student, we need, we all should know that uh, we should know the importance of the anatomy, the various barriers of tumor spread, the compartment, the larynx, because it's got a bearing in the conservation laryngectomy. And also, you know that the tumors can stay in within the compartment for long periods, and it is possible for these tumors to be removed uh, completely oncologically by a conservation laryngectomy. We should have a good idea about what are the laryngeal functions that we are referring to when it comes to uh, management of uh, dysfunctional larynx in the case of laryngeal malignancy or a functional larynx in laryngeal malignancy. History taking becomes an important ingredient of a, a clinical evaluation of these patients and so is the clinical examination, indirect laryngoscopy and examination of neck. We, the, the student should be well aware about the behavior of these tumors, how it, the pathology, pathologically the tumor progresses within the larynx and outside the larynx. The tumor behavior, commonest malignancy of the larynx being the squamous cell carcinoma. The, we all should be abreast with the present TNM staging, 8th edition of the TOICC TNM staging. Role of angled laryngeal telescopy, stroboscopy, and narrowband imaging in the evaluation of these malignancies and a thorough radiological evaluation, including a CT scan and MRI, wherever it's indicated. And the surgeon or the well treat person treating should have a good three dimensional picture of the tumor and its relations within the larynx or outside it. And we also should know about the pre-malignant, what are different pre-malignant lesions involving the larynx and how do you manage carcinoma in situ or a replace carcinoma of the larynx. The microlaryngoscopy, telelaryngeal surgeries, the indications, the contraindications, how it is done, technique, and uh, um, how to do a precise surgery of the telelaryngeal or microlaryngeal surgery. We all know glottic malignancy has a good, very good prognosis. Why? We'll try to answer that. And the state of the goal later into the management of early cancers, laser versus radiotherapy, and also management of advanced cancers, chemoradiation versus surgery followed by radiotherapy, and role of other conservation procedures today, voice rehabilitation procedures after total laryngectomy pros and cons, and the oncological outcomes of water treatment. So we'll not be able to discuss all this in a, in a 40 or 45 minutes. So straight away we'll go into the last five or six points and rest. We presume that the students are aware of what the other points. So we'll straight away go into management of the uh, laryngeal cancers. Once they are diagnosed and staged, how do you go about from there? So before that, Laryngeal cancer, especially glottic malignancy, has got a good prognosis because they present early with forces and it is possible to detect these patients in the early stage, especially glottic involved in the membranous cord, and uh, the outcomes of treatment are very good. And glottis is a watershed area with, respect, with poor lymphatics, so the lymphatic spread in early glottic malignancies are less unless it's involved in the anterior the posterior commissure or extending to the supraglottis or the subglottis or going beyond the into the larynx then of course, of course there's going to be higher chance of lymphatic spread. We all need to know about the laryngeal compartments, the barriers of the, uh, the, 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 the larynx which contains the disease for some time and uh, the, because of this the laryngeal compartments again the laryngeal cancer can be completely resected with that particular knowledge and uh, with the preservation of uh, its function in most of the cases of uh, even advanced or locally advanced malignancies. They have a very well-defined lymph node metastasis, supraglottis or subglottis. They have um, the involvement of lymph nodes are quite, quite uh, methodical and they are well defined and it is possible for the surgeon or the, the treating radio oncologist to include all this in that particular field of radiation if it is going for a patient going for chemo radiation. And in case of early malignancy, even a two to three millimeter wide margin resection using laser is quite adequate. So it is possible to preserve the vocal function as well, not only we're able to offer a cure, but also a good voice 
and hence the quality of life is definitely going to be better. And even the locally advanced tumors like uh, T3 lesions or supraglottis or the glottis are amenable to chemo radiation, some sort of organ preservation protocol or a conservation, the injectable. So this is the, the, the big transition that has taken place after the VI trial and organ preservation has been given a lot of uh, importance in the management of these locally advanced laryngeal malignancies. Even if there is extra laryngeal spread or a non-functional larynx, they can still do the entire larynx and subject this patient to radiotherapy and the five-year survival rates of these patients are one of the best among the head and neck cancers. So it is always better that these patients are diagnosed early and treated early and we can not only offer a good cure but also a good quality of life. We see the prognosis, even a stage 4 lesion of the canned larynx, the 5-year survival rate is as high as 44%. As you all know, the sites of these tumors are supraglottis, glottis and subglottis. Incidents may vary from region to region. And in India, we see quite a bit of uh, supraglottic malignancies, but then glottic malignancies are the commonest ones uh, compared to the supraglottic malignancy. Subglottic is very rare, it's about a person, 1%. Now, they, depending, because of the, uh, the structure of this uh, tricot cartilage, this glottis, uh, the anterior glottis is quite wide, it's almost 10 millimeters from the free margin and about 5 millimeters posteriorly from the free margin of the vocal cord. So there, there is some glottis towards in relation to the cricoid cartilage is actually quite a bit low and this under surface of the vocal cord need not be treated as a subglottic malignancy. They are still amenable to surgical treatment and the conservation, some form of a conservation laryngectomy. Now quickly going to various modalities of treatment. The treatment intent is most of the time a curative intent unless you have a stage 4b lesion uh, where the treatment remains a palliative treatment or in the case of a survey setting and a recurrent malignancies or residual malignancies then probably treatment goes into a palliative intent. Otherwise a general modality treatment is surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy and a combined modality of treatment where is mixture of these. Generally, stage 1 and stage 2 lesions, they need a single modality of treatment, either surgery or radiotherapy. And in advanced malignancy, like stage 3 and stage 4, they require a combined modality of treatment. It's either surgery followed by radiotherapy or it is a chemo radiation, some form of chemo radiation, CTRT. So, it is important for us to classify these tumors precisely using the TNM classification. Again, I want of time, I will not go into much details of the TNM classification. Supraglottis, again, the various stages, T1 to T4A, T4B. T4A, where there is invasion through the chiroid cartilage and goes beyond the larynx involving the soft tissues and also the deep or extensive muscle. Tongue. T4B, where it involves the pre-vertebral space in cases of the carotid artery, or the media standard structures. Similarly, the glottic malignancies are classified into T1 to T4B. T1 is where the tumor is restricted, confined to the vocal cords. T1A is limited to one vocal cord. T1B where it is again restricted vocal cord but not both the cords. T2 where it extends to supraglottis or subglottis or it causes vocal cord mobility impairment. T3 is an important lesion for us where there is where the lesion extends beyond the nuclear cords and enters the paraglottic space or the <coughs> preglottic space and involves the inner cortex of the cartilage, thyroid cartilage. Uh, limited involvement of the, uh, the the extensive involvement of the thyroid cartilage, the outer cortex is also involved or with external angel spread becomes a T4A and similarly T4B will be and it involves the pre-vertebral space in case of the carotid artery or the media cellular structures. Lymph node catastasis, lymph node staging is uh, almost the same in all the head and neck, most of the head and neck malignancies. Management of laryngeal cancer is a paradigm shift to what we used to practice earlier and to what is being practiced now, especially in the early malignancies. T1, earlier, T1, T2 lesions, earlier, most of them landed with radiotherapy. And some of them, suitable cases, 
and where the expertise was available, a conservation learning activity was being done. But by and large, most of the early malignancies were treated by a non-surgical treatment by a radiotherapy. But now, a lot of emphasis on endoscopic laser surgery for select T1, T2 lesions or not, I mean, not uh, suitable for laser surgery or when there is um, less of expertise or uh, facilities for laser surgery, of course, they still go for radiotherapy and select cases, conservation and electrolyte. So now we have a, a option of endoscopic laser surgery that is there for early lesions. And T3 lesions earlier, most of them landed with surgery, either a total or a near total lensectomy, followed by radiotherapy. And now we have a big transition there where chemo radiation is given a big boost because of the possibility of an organ preservation. And here we need to select these cases carefully, which should be as where the larynx is functional. The larynx should be functional, and if it's non functional, then you only have T3 lesions, they tend to go for a surgery followed by radiotherapy. But not of these patients who have received chemotherapy with the, with the mind or with the intention of organ preservation, later would have developed residual malignancies or uh, non-functional larynx and they may be subjected to a salvage. But by and large, there's a lot of, lot of cases they are able to preserve the functional larynx in the locally advanced malignancies and this is the primary modality of treatment in such uh, such uh, stage of glottic or superglottic malignancies. So coming to various surgeries as possible in the cancer larynx, we have a big list of these surgeries right from transoral microlaryngeal surgery with or without laser or robot and to the other extreme we have a total laryngectomy. And the conservation laryngectomy, when we have glottic lesions, we tend to do what's called as a vertical partial laryngectomy, a supraglottic lesion, there are horizontal partial laryngectomy. And um, supratricoid laryngectomy is where the tricoid cartilage per se or subglottis per se is normal, uh, not involved, but there is bilateral involvement of these lesions where a simple vertical partial laryngectomy or a Northern partial laryngectomy would not be a suffice. So we do supraclicoid laryngectomy in certain select cases. Near total laryngectomy is something short of total laryngectomy where the indication for a total laryngectomy would be still there. But then if it is possible to preserve one functional cricoretinoid unit, then we can do what's called near total laryngectomy just with the intention of giving these patients a post laryngectomy voice without a need for a tracheoesophageal puncture. So near total laryngectomy is almost a total laryngectomy except that we are preserving a functional cricoarytenoid unit for the purpose of voice uh, rehabilitation without a need for a TEP. But they still have continued to have a tracheostoma. So by and large, most of the advanced cases, they may land up with a near total or a total laryngectomy. And the early cases, we may have to we do a conservation laryngectomy or we may use laser <coughs> in the select cases. So, laser, <coughs> the, the preferred laser is a carbon dioxide laser because it's precise, the depth penetration is less, and even the lateral damage, the tissue damage is less. And uh, this is the preferred laser, in the, especially in the glottic malignancies. But we need a good setup for that and uh, operation, operating microscope, the laser machine, it's arm, arm, arms for transfer the thread beam and then uh, a joystick so that you can use this to shoot the aiming beam onto the laser. That's a joystick which is used you through the microscope. So you're going to see the lesion and with the aiming beam we can adjust the way how much you're going to cut, how much you're going to vaporize. So the settings are usually by the acute spot or acute blade, and we can set in the, the size of these blades or spots, whether it's curved or straight, and usually it's about 10 wire settings, or it could be 7 to 10 wire setting on a continuous mode, unless you have a very early lesion where you can use the acute spot if you don't have lower. 
how I taste setting. The advantage of laser in early glottic malignancy is that in selected cases, we can do a precise resection which is oncologically sound. At the same time, we can preserve the uninvolved layers of the vocal cord. As you all know, the vocal cord is made up of multiple layers. It has got a superficial mucosa and then the gelatinous layer, there is the lamina propria, superficial lamina propria. And then we have a deeper lamina propria, which is made of elastic layer and the collagen layer. And then we have the vocalis muscle. So we have uh, mucosa, lamina propria, three layers, and then the vocalis muscle. So if there are deeper layers that are not involved, then those can be preserved. So the voice preservation is going to be good. At the same time, we, need, we can have a good oncological outcome. But the prerequisite, we need to select these cases very properly and we have a good uh, understanding of the depth of these lesions. So the preferred lesions for a, a laser-rested glottic uh, lesion would be a premalignant lesion or a carcinoma in situ or T1 lesions confined to the membranous vocal cord. This is in the view of uh, having a good vocal outcome. But even a T2 lesions can be resected using a uh, laser, but or when there's enter commission involvement, the voice outcome would be poorer, even though you can get oncologically good uh, resection, the voice outcomes would be poorer than a radiotherapy. So when you are thinking in terms of voice outcome as a major uh, outcome measure, then we need to select these cases properly maybe maximum a T1A or select T1B lesions, T2, we tend to go in for a radiation therapy as a treatment unless there are other indications for that. So, early glottic medicine advantage over radiotherapy would be that the oncologically there is a equal two rates, but we have a big advantage is that the hospital stay is, is uh, very short in the case of laser group. And it is you are repeatable even if the patient needs two or three revisions it's still fine because you are there the hospital stay is going to be very short it will be one or two days versus six weeks if the patient goes for radiotherapy so in that way there's early return to work so it is actually a cost effective procedure cost effective procedure in the terms of loss of man hours is much less in the case of laser group other advantage is that the laser preserves the normal functional mucosal pliability. Uninvolved parts of the larynx are not being resected. So the vocal outcome, especially in the long term, would be better in select cases of vocal or vocal cord malignancies. It could be better, even better than a radiation therapy in select cases. Because radiation therapy affects the entire larynx. You are going to burn the entire larynx, irradiate the entire larynx and the neck. And even if you are having a AMRT or IGRT or whatever, the tissue sparing effect for a larynx is going to be less, less. And so the bulk of the larynx is being irradiated whether it is affected or not. So imagine your right open cord is involved and left open cord is not involved. But then the, open, the radiation effects irradiates both the open cords. So the, there is going to be short and long term uh, toxicity and hence it's more morbid and uh, poorer vocal outcome, especially in the long term assessment. So quality of life is poorer when it comes to radiotherapy. Plus ionizing radiation um, can cause long term permanent hypothyroidism and may need a long lifelong medication. And also this preserves all the other conventional cancer treatment options, including conservation lymphectomy or total lymphectomy or radiotherapy, or any second primary malignancy that could occur, or even if there is a residual or recurrent malignancies of the other areas of the larynx, we still have other options of treatment kept to open, especially in a young patient. The steps are to minimize the lateral effect is most important when you use laser. So whereas if it is an early, it's really involving only this superficial mucosa, then we can inject subepithelial saline so that it gets lifted, the, 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 the underlying vocal ligament uh, gets, the mucus gets lifted from the vocal ligament and uh, that part, the injury to the vocal ligament can be lessened. When a two millimeter margin is sufficient and a lower wattage sufficient, wattage is setting is also sufficient in early malignancies. The important step is to identify the vocal ligament early, especially 
either anteriorly or posteriorly or both beyond the tumor first and then try to trace that or these reach, reach the lift, it, lift off the tumor by preserving the vocal ligament and also we need to identify the vocalis muscle. So here you can see this is the vocal ligament after resection and it's the vocalis muscle preserved and the tumor has been resected by a laser surgeon. So it is usually done by what's called as a peeling off technique, holding the margin of the that wide margin, mucosal margin at one end and use laser in an oblique manner and try to lift off the tumor as you are using laser as a cutting tool, precise cutting tool. And if it is not getting lifted up easily, that means it's more adherent to the ligament, then the deeper layers or that superficial layer of the ligament also may be resected uh, and end block to make sure that you're going to have a good uh, oncologically sound resection. And we need to confirm that our margins are clear by going for a frozen section control of all the different margins, anterior, posterior, lateral, medial, and even the deeper margins. So, European Laryngological Society has classified these tumors into various types. Type 1 is subepithelial, uh, subepithelial cordectomies, where the lesion only on the epithelium is been resected, subligamental, where you, you resect the ligament as well, and transmuscular is where you go across the vocalis muscle and resect the, the entire vocal cord. Not, not a total cordectomy, but transmuscular is type 3. And here you have a total cordectomy, entire cord till the cartilage and the tricothyroid membrane is being resected. That is a type 4 cordectomy, type 4 cordectomy where the entire cord is resected. When the total cordectomy is, it goes beyond that type 4 extent where we have anticommissary resection, it becomes type 5A when you are including the arytenoids, that is a arytenoid type 4b including the ventricular band is your type 4 or type type c and when you're including the subglottis as well the total cortectomy is including the subglottis in type 4d so the type 4 is subdivided to a b c d depending on what is the extension of the total cortectomy right this is a small video i'll just show the initial part and the later part it's an early glottic you see more of a a verrucous type and proliferative type and we can use laser in a, as a cutting tool called carbon dioxide laser and once you resect it we try to uh, resect it this is the vocal ligament and that is the vocalis muscle and we try to resect as completely as possible preserving as much as the vocal ligament and the vocalis muscle so, in your know, supraglottic cancer, a total, uh, the transural laryngeal surgery or transural robotic surgery has got the same advantages as you see in the glottic malignancy. It's less morbid, and mortality is less, laryngeal functions are preserved. This is the most important thing is that the aspiration part is preserved. When you do a supraglottic laryngectomy, an external approach, the laryngeal functions are often affected because you land up injuring one of these superior laryngeal nodes. But here, Laryngeal functions are often preserved, or there's return of laryngeal functions much early when you do a supraglottic laryngectomy using laser by an endoscopic or endo transoral approach. And often it is possible to prevent or avoid a permanent tracheostomy. The duration of hospitalization is less and is definitely a cost effective method, and quality of life is better. So, for a supraglottic malignancy, we can use either a CO2 laser or KTP 532 laser. We have used both for such supraglottic lesions. And I go on to the KTP 530 is a more powerful cutting tool as well as a coagulating tool because KTP is an angiolytic laser. Lasers. So the time taken for the supraglottic laryngectomy using a laser with the KTP is much less compared to CO2 laser. And CO2 laser will end up most of the time bleeding and you know, operating time becomes much more than in CO2 laser for a supraglottic malignancy. And plus we are going to use, we can use fiber optic cables. There is a tactile feedback inside of them. You can feel the hyoid bone, you can feel the thyroid cartilage as you are using the laser. So you are more quick in, in, in performing such a procedure because you have a good fiber optic 
tactile feedback. So the operating time is less and post-operative bleeding is also less common, when, especially when the laser, KTP 532 laser is used. For this, we need what is called as the VIRDAS laryngoscope or the STARS has got a supraglottoscope with or without tongue blade so that it is possible for us to retract the, uh, the, the supraglottis and expose that area which we need to uh, resect more precisely by using these uh, specialized micro laryngoscopes. As a KTP fighter laser with the, with the fiber optic cable being used to the, the final devices. And that's the advantage is that tactile feedback that we get using such a laser. So using such laser, uh, we can do just a uh, just an epiglottectomy depending on the lesion that is there, just an epiglottectomy or you do the entire supraglottic laryngectomy right from the ventricular band to the supraglottomy where epiglottis. Or in the, in the case of uh, lesion extending it to the base of the tongue or vellicular, you can even do what's called an extended supraglottic laryngectomy. But we always prefer to use these lasers in the more of a median lesions than a lateral lesions. So endoscopic supraglottic laryngectomies, European Laryngological Society has again proposed a classification just like what they have done for a glottic malignancy. Type 1 resection is where it is limited excision of small size superficial lesion, maybe on the epiglottis or on the retinoids or on the ventricular holes. And it's just a local, wide local excision of a small lesion. That's a type 1 lesion. This should be a superficial lesion. Type 2 is Median supraglottic laryngectomy without resecting the pre-epiglottic space. Imagine that there is a lesion in the in the suprahyoid or infrahyoid epiglottis, but there is no extension of this tumor into the pre-epiglottis. Maybe we just have to excise that part of the epiglottis or supraglottis. So it's a median supraglottic laryngectomy without resection of the uh, the, the pre-epiglottic space. Again, it's a median supraglottis. So we always prefer it's a median lesion that is there because it is easy to resect with less of functional dis, uh, uh, dis, uh, out, uh, dysfunctional outcomes. So type A is where it is uh, just uh, the epiglottis and type 2B is where we also involve the, the part of the ventricular band. Type 3 is median supraglottic laryngectomy with resection of the preepiglottic space. So your the preepiglottic space is resected but it's a median supraglottic laryngectomy with resection of preepiglottic space. Type 3A is where only the epiglottis is resected. Type 3B is where we also include the ventricular fold in our resection. So that is type 3B. Type 4 is lateral supraglottic laryngectomy. We will produce little poorer outcomes when it comes to functional outcomes because they tend to have some amount of aspiration. But they are all transient aspirations, suitable for tumors of the threefold. Threefold means where the pharyngoepiglottic fold, epiglottis, and the epiglottic fold they meet. It's called a threefold region. And this may involve the ventricular band, it may involve the, epi, the, the arytenoids. Depending on that, we have T4A or T4B when the arytenoid is also resected on one particular side. So it's a lateral supraglottic line making type 4. So, you have a small lesion like that, you can completely excise it precisely with preservation of the vocal cord using laser. Or you have a huge lesion arising from the ventricular line like that, but underlying vocal cord is normal, ventricular ventricle is normal, then we don't have to do anything much. So, we can resect these lesions effectively and uh, we can have preserve the rest of the vocal cord like that. So, or we have a supraglottic lesions uh, involving the laryngeal surface, so the lingual surface, the laryngeal surface, and the base of the tongue. Again, we say can resect these lesions uh, using the uh, KTP or laser, and the outcomes would be that it will be like this post operatively. And we have once this heals, it once this heals, it, you can get a, a nice well epithelized larynx without uh, aspiration, both cords are mobile. You can see nicely that the entire uh, the larynx is normal and functional in the case of laser surgery. 
The complications of a supraglottic laryngectomy are much less in the case of endoscopic compared to the standard supraglottic laryngectomy like aspiration, vestibular stenosis, need for permanent tracheostomies, laryngeal edema. All that is less because there is preservation of superior laryngeal nerve and scar formation is also less. Loss of cartilage involvement, wound infections, like pericondritis, chondronecrosis, all that is going to be less when it is a laser or such. So, various uh, articles supporting the, uh, the transoral laser surgery proglottic malignancies, uh, good oncological outcomes, and low levels of voice and so on regulated quality of life impairment. Various articles, I don't want to go into details of that, and it says. Endoscopic supraglottic laryngectomy plays a positive role in the recovery of this patient and preservation of the anteripiglottic space, ventricular band, retinoid cartilage without destroying the external framework and effectively reduce the risk of aspiration pneumonia. So, uh, various studies have actually supported this uh, form of treatment. In advanced laryngeal malignancies, uh, it could be a T3 lesion, a locally advanced malignancies, T3 lesions where the paraglottic and the preepiglottic space is involved uh, with or without minimal cartilage erosion, but functions of the larynx are preserved, no aspiration, it's a painless larynx, patent airway, not trichostomized, functions are preserved. Then the treatment of choice will be a chemo radiation, concurrent chemo radiation. But there are some individuals where chemo may not be indicated or may be contraindicated or patient does not want to do chemotherapy. Then the other option is we go to go for a conservation laryngectomy followed by radiotherapy. The conservation, not conservative laryngectomy, conservation laryngectomy with the intention of preserving the laryngeal function. So conservation laryngectomy followed by radiotherapy. But by and large, most of these patients land up with chemo radiation and locally advanced it's a T3 lesion. Of course, since grossly, gross involvement, grossly advanced is a T4A lesion, gross cartilage involvement, extra laryngeal spread, or it may be even a T3 lesions where the laryngeal functions are lost. Patient is aspirating, it's a painful larynx, patient is already tracheostomized, compromised airway, then these patients are suitable for total laryngectomy followed by radiotherapy, and chemo may or may not be added depending on the your histopathological report whether you have a clear margins and whether there is any extranodal involvement in the lymph node that is affected. So the treatment is well defined in these patients. If locally advanced chemoradiation, T3 plus or other option will be conservation laryngectomy, cross involvement, T4A total laryngectomy, radiotherapies with or without uh, with or without chemotherapy. Now the bigger problem that we are facing nowadays is post chemo radiation, we get a lot of cases of salvage laryngectomy. We have to do salvage laryngectomy or a salvage conservation laryngectomy. Again, that is a new thing that is that is the new challenges that we are facing is these patients they tend to develop uh hemicutus fistula and the, the 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 quality of life is definitely poorer. So there is a controversy whether we are trying to preserve the larynx, are we uh, coming down on the survival rates, especially when you have a salary setting, are we coming down on the quality of life going on for a preservation of the, uh, non-surgical preservation of the larynx. Those are controversial areas, but at the exam level, it is, I think, for us, this uh, correct to say that locally advanced malignancies, T3 lesions, concurrent chemotherapy, optional, Conservation laryngectomy is there. The conservation laryngectomy, as I said earlier, it is for some reasons the concurrent chemotherapy is not possible. Then we can go for a the, the conservation laryngectomy. But all these cases, we need to make sure that we have selected cases where three-dimensional tumor anatomy is is well defined by your radiation by your uh, chemo by uh, sorry by, by CT scan. We are well aware of the, uh, the extent of the lesion, and we should make sure that we will be able to completely resect the tumor by that particular compartment. Conservation laryngectomy and radiation therapy will be such an option. So various options that we will just try to discuss on that. That is possible because of the compartments, the larynx, 
definite patterns of local spread and small margins are acceptable. Even five millimeter human margins are acceptable in, in when it comes to resection and adaptation in younger patients. And patients, even during a big resection, they tend to adapt, the aspiration stops for a period of time. And in a salvage setting, you should be very choosy while trying to do a conservation landectomy. You should know exactly what was the primary treatment, tumor extent, and then only think in terms of doing a conservation laryngectomy in a select salvage setting. So, in a salvage setting, there is a tendency for us to go for a total laryngectomy. So, the prerequisites for a conservation laryngectomy is that it should be preferable that you have an exophytic lesion than an endophytic lesion more localized and we have a three-dimensional assessment that is done by a contrast enhanced CT scan. Patient factors is where a patient has got a good pulmonary function, pulmonary function test is good and patient is willing to undergo some form of a, uh, is undergo the total endectomy on table or later depending on table we find a different uh, the tumor extent is something different than what we thought saw during the Evaluation patients should be willing to come for a regular follow because you are actually uh, you, there is a higher incidence of possibility of a residual tumor in these conservation laryngectomies, and and we should have a precise expertise should be there to do a conservation laryngectomy. So various times let's go a few examples. Like imagine that there is a lesion unilateral glottic lesion that is going across the ventricle involving the preepiglot the para the the, the paraglottic space, but the preepiglottic space is free and the subglottis is free. So, tumor is restricted to this particular lesion, then we can do what is called as the vertical partial laryngectomy because the tumor is coming very close to the cartilage. It is better that that cartilage is resected by a vertical partial laryngectomy, preserving the retinoids, the opposite vocal cord, opposite cricoretinoid unit, all that is preserved. And once you resect it, you can reconstruct that. Area. In a by this sterno heart, sterno heart flap can be transferred inside and we can uh, have a good uh, voice outcome as well. So that is how it is done. The, the, the cricoid is free, the hyoid bone is free, and you can do a wide local excision like that by doing a vertical partial laryngectomy. And if this lesion is going, imagine it's going across the anterior and going into the opposite paraglottic space, still the subglottis is free, the, the preapiglottis is free, we can do a, a still a vertical partial laryngectomy. It's a frontal vertical partial laryngectomy, and uh, and you can rotate the strap muscles inside and suture it up. And uh, voice outcomes may be poorer, but still you have uh, achieved an oncologically sound procedure by doing a vertical partial laryngectomy. If you feel that it is going to the opposite side or very close to the arytenoids, so previously that in the previous case, the arytenoid was not involved, the arytenoid was free, but he feel that it is involved in local process or the arytenoids, and, and then we can even do what's called as a hemilaryngectomy, preserving the opposite uh, larynx, it can be preserved, or we can have an oncologically sound procedure. There is subglottic involvement, but it is only on one particular side. Subglottic in all one particular side, you can do a, a neototal laryngectomy. Strictly speaking, neototal laryngectomy is not a conservation laryngectomy because patient will land up with a tracheostomy, but at least we have a reconstructed of the the, 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 the the voice is preserved in this case, or we have restored the voice. So we can do a sub we can do what is called as the near total laryngectomy when there is a subglottic involvement on the particular side. So there is a neototal laryngectomy where one cricoarytenoid unit is preserved and should be normal functional but is innervated. So cricoarytenoid is preserved and rest of the larynx is resected and that means at least one half of the cricoid cartilage is preserved and you have a functioning unit. So the entire thing is resected except that one cricoarytenoid unit is preserved and should be functional and should be having an innervation. So once it is resected, then the, using the adjacent pharyngeal, the hyperpharyngeal mucosa, the entire thing is rotated and it, you, the, 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 the defect is closed after having a, a, a sort of a TE uh, shunt. 
the TE shunt that is created because between the trachea and the larynx, you have a shunt that is created that is used for uh, phonation at a more voice restoration later. But the patient will have a permanent tracheostomy. Now we have a supraglottic lesion involving the say the ventricular band, the preepiglottic space is involved, the hyoid bone is involved, going on to the epiglottis. We can still like the, what we talked about, the endoscopic supraglottic lattice. We here we can do an external procedure, external supraglottic laryngectomy. And if the lesion is going into the base septum, it can do extended supraglottic laryngectomy. So these are the horizontal laryngectomy, horizontal uh, laryngectomy, conservation laryngectomies. It could be epiglottectomy, it could be a supraglottectomy or you can be extended supraglottectomy and we are talking here about a extend, external procedures. Now we have a lesion with in, it is not involved with required nor the higher bone. Tumor is involved in both the sides. The other option that we have is called as the supratracoid laryngectomies. It could be trichohyodopexy, trichohyodopexy or a trichohyodopexy. So we can even remove the epiglottis. We have to remove the epiglottis, trichohyodopexy. And when you have a, a, only the epiglottis is preserved, it becomes trichohyodopexy. But the higher chances, because the entire vocal cord is resected in these cases, there is higher chance of patient having postoperative aspiration. And young, young individuals, they may come out of it, it's a transient aspiration. And most of these patients, they can be decannulated. Initially, most of these patients have a tracheostomy. If you have a tracheostomy, they can be decannulated once the aspiration stops. So these are the different supratracheoid laryngectomies, trichohyodopexy, trichohyodopiglottopexy, and trichohyodopiglottopexy, total. Coming to the last type of tumors that we, uh, that we deal with would be uh, uh, a total laryngectomy. We do a total laryngectomy, and these total laryngectomies are done for T4A lesions. T4A lesions, and then these tumors have come outside the larynx. They have come, there is extra laryngeal spread. So if T4 elation, the, 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 the resection above is above the higher bone and below it would encompass a proximal trachea and rest of the trachea is converted into a permanent tracheostomy. Indications for that would be when there's extra laryngeal spread, there's extensive cartilage involvement, subglottic tumor extension, and the interarytenoid region is involved where a neurotrotal laryngectomy is contraindicated. Uh, post radiation or post chemo radiation residual with anterior extensions, probably the salvage total laryngectomy is ideal. Or we have a non functional larynx, a painful larynx, aspiration is there, or patient is not willing or affording a second uh, surgery in, the, when you are in terms of a conservation laryngectomy. Probably it's worthwhile uh, in our setup where we have a lot of poor patients who don't are not willing to come for a second surgery if necessary. Then we can go in for a total surgery. After that, is a very controversial, controversial statement. And if we're expecting a poor follow up, then better to do a total laryngectomy, especially when there is a uh, advanced malignancy. But make sure that there is no carotid encasement, there's no mediastinal involvement, prevertebral muscle involvement, and no, no distant metastasis. So these are the cases suitable. There's extra laryngeal spread coming out of the larynx. Laryngeal malignancy, then we need to do a total laryngectomy, resect all that skin that is involved like that. And you are in a case of uh, necrosis, osteoradial necrosis, or a non functional larynx post chemo radiation. So, this is a post chemo radiation patient who has come to us with a fistula. You know, the tumor is taken care of, he has, he has got a communicating fistula and he has got aspiration. And these are the cases where we may have to go in for a total. Laryngectomy. All these patients need to, we need to address the lar the, the neck as well. In a case of N0 neck, we do a lateral neck, bilateral neck, lateral neck dissection. And again, positive neck, we'll have to do a some form of radical neck dissection or a some form of medical modified radical neck dissection. So neck has to be addressed in all these whether it's a glottic or supraglottic malignancy, unless it is a very select 
uh, superficial T1 lesions of the glottis or a uh, the epiglottic lesions, T1 lesion over the epiglottis, probably we can do away without a neck dissection, but these patients should be kept on a regular follow-up. Not play the entire video, just this uh, usually uh, the incision that is used mod modified so of incision for a uh, laryngectomy from one mastoid to another mastoid around the stoma and the stoma is there and it is a sublatismal flap and do a lateral neck dissection or some form of neck dissection as indicated and once it is done then we have we need to ligate the superior uh, superior thyroid artery so neck dissection has been done exposing the carotid and the interjugular vein all the nodes have been cleared here and we need to like it the superior thyroid artery then you dissect downwards identify the inferior thyroid artery if you are not preserving that part of the hemithyroid usually we try to preserve one of the hemithyroid on the contralateral side so if you are not preserving the we are planning to dissect that particular thyroid then we can uh, like the inferior thyroid artery or we can try and spare the parathyroids and dissect the rest of the thyroids wherever possible. So usually contralateral parathyroid or contralateral hemithyroid could be preserved uh, in most of the cases wherever there is no not much of subglottic extension. So that is inferior dissection and then inferior the trachea is separated from the esophagus identified the laryngeal nerve is cut and then we work above the hyoid this is a hyoid bone and you detach the suprahyoid muscles from the hyoid bone and we make an entry into the larynx through the valecula. Ideally, you enter through the non affected side first so that you can know what you're cutting and not cutting across the tumor. And under vision, we can advance our incisions across, preserving the, the frontolateral pyriform sinus mucosa wherever possible. So the, the mucosal incisions are made, and usually they're made towards the posterior margin of the thyroid and. So once it is done like that, so larynx is delivered from above downwards and then the, it is separated and the larynx specimen is detached. So this is the post resection. We have this the mucosal margin that you have on hemithyroid that is preserved. And at this point of time, we need to think about possibility of doing a TEP tracheal puncture. And you should make sure the neopharyngeal lumen is, that actually, is going to be there, will be of a near normal size. And we can do a cricophenyl myotomy to pre prevent a cricophenyl spasm. And we do a primary TEP in most of the cases, unless there is a contraindication or there is a patient is not willing for that. A lot of people avoid closure of the muscular layer to prevent a cricophenyl spasm and make sure the stoma is of adequate size, what is called as a helmacus technique. We're showing the cricophenyl myotomy being done where a finger is passed into the the, the cricopharynx and feeling your the mucosa, you're going to cut the, 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 crico, the cricopharyngeal muscle is cut till the level of the mucosa, making sure you're not going to make a uh, cut through, you're not going to cut through the mucosal layer. And then we can do a TEP by using a right angled forceps through the esophagus, indenting onto the posterior tracheal wall about 5 millimeter below inferior to the tracheal margins and make a puncture and pass a maybe a rice tube or a catheter or you want to process it straight away into that particular site where you have made a TEP and you can close the, 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 the by a continuous interlocking inverting sutures of the mucosa and and the muscular layer may be sutured or may not be sutured depending on your, your requirement various types of closure, primary closure of the pharynx. If you don't have adequate, mu adequate mucosa, then it's ideal that you take some form of local flap, like a patch, pharyngoplasty, so the patient will not develop post-operative dysphagia. Tracheostomy, ideally done as a hammercus technique, where the lower flap, and that cartilage trachea is sutured to the lower flap, and the membranous trachea is sutured to the upper flap. So that's what you get post-suturing. Post, um, so speech rehabilitation for total laryngectomy is by a usually by done by a TEP uh, and fit in a processes either a Provox or a Blomsinger or some local made processes 
and this process allows one way passage of air from the trachea into the esophagus or the pharyngoceal segment but if uh, but not other way around saliva or the food should not get through the pre puncture into the trachea and should not aspirate so this process is basically what is called voice process basically it's a valve that allows direction of the air into the into the pharynx and not saliva from the pharynx in or esophagus into the trachea so basically do a surgically created tp fistula it could be a primary tp or a secondary tp secondary tp is done maybe after even a radiation therapy so that means patient has to wait for 3 to 4 months after everything heals and is suitable then we go in for a secondary tp means he has to wait so long to get back his some form of voice so we use lungs to pump the air through the through the tp into the pharynx to vibrate the pharyngoesophageal segment pe segment or pharyngoesophageal segment and these processes could be a one way valve is usually one way valve it could be indwelling or a removable processes the advantage of doing a primary tp is that it avoids the second procedure and you have a very early voice rehabilitation and t vistula can be used initially as a feeding esophagostoma if you have not fitted the processes straight away but there is disadvantage of doing a primary tp where there is higher incidence of fistula formation leakage around the processes edema around the tracheal puncture site leading to patient discouragement plus some amount of pain is going to be there even after the, the, the even on the 12th day or 14th day you start to ask the patient to start speaking it this actually discourages him because there is a it is not fully healed tp side is going to be edema the, the, the surgical wound is not completely healed and there is risk of tracheostomal stenosis due to placement of a valve or a catheter and most importantly there is a very high expectation of returned voice quality because he expected his normal voice he was going to get back his normal voice but in a secondary tp is not that he has been he has, has no voice for a quite some number of time and whatever voice you give he is going to be a very happy patient when it comes to return of voice so in a primary tp there are higher expectations regarding the return of voice so all the disadvantages of primary tp could be advantage of a secondary tp less fistula formation less leakage around the processes less discouragement to these patients and all this the, there's less expectations about the voice quality in these patients so all the disadvantage of primary tp could be advantage of a secondary tp so i think i have spoken quite a lot to conclude there are barriers of tumor spread in the, in the larynx which divides the larynx into known well-defined compartments and these tumors spread uh, these tumors confined to those compartments can be resected by what's called as a conservation laryngectomy preserving the laryngeal functions we need to assess clinically endoscopically radiologically the precise extent of the primary lesion and the possible lymph node metastasis and plan the appropriate treatment modality of the modalities and early lesions or even a locally advanced malignancy of the larynx are amenable to curative treatment with some form of organ preservation. It, organ preservation could be a non surgical organ preservation like chemo radiation or a surgical organ preservation like a conservation laryngectomy followed by radiotherapy. So, plan the surgical approach and extent of resection well ahead, keeping the roadmap that is your CT scan and the three dimensional tumor anatomy that you are seeing. And always think about voice rehabilitation, rehabilitation, not necessarily just the voice rehabilitation, swallowing rehabilitation, neck rehabilitation, we have done a neck dissection rehabilitation of the uh, post neck dissection rehabilitation, vocational rehabilitation. So rehabilitation is a big area following surgery. Ultimate aim of the treatment for cancer larynx is not only cure, but also good quality of life and return of vocal function. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Um, I am open to questions. I see Dr. Nilima Gupta there. Uh, good evening, Dr. Balakrishnan. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks I appreciate you. your uh, time and uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Thanks,
with the uh, good surgical videos and the photographs i think uh, the students would have really understood uh, the concept of uh, frontal partial laryngectomy near total laryngectomy and the uh, total laryngectomy and i think they get a lot of questions on this aspect of uh, uh, laryngeal surgeries and uh, indications for the different procedures yes ma'am so uh, I, we are open for questions. If uh, there are any questions, please type in the chat box. I think it was a very uh, lucid presentation and uh, not you. many questions are uh, there. I don't see any question in the chat box. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a student is asking whether uh, robotic surgical techniques uh, would be used for the laryngeal surgeries or are being used. Yes, the supraglottic malignancies, early supraglottic malignancies, as I said earlier, yes. in this that you can use a robot and there you have said advantages that you have a precise uh, resection and uh, and control of bleeding also is much much easier with the robotic surgeries. So the robot has got definite advantage, but it is more in a supraglottic malignancies, like epiglottis or aryepiglottic fold. Supraglottic malignancies are amenable to robotic surgeries. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Asmita, uh, you want to see the lectures uh, again? Uh, I think uh, I if the... the... I can share the presentation. Yes, and if the panelists uh, agree, if the presenter agrees, so these are recorded and then they are uh, posted on the NBEMS uh, website. So, you can uh, uh, go there and uh, the National Board of Examination website, you can... Uh, access the presentations or the lectures so you can uh, see them again yes mr navneet if you are there uh, i think you can add on to it <laughs> 